Hey guys, I'm Hosak Dennis and you are watching Wind News. This week was in the name of reveals once again and we even saw the full release of Iron Judgment this week too. It would take me too much time to cover every release card this week and the weeks before when I wasn't here. So I'll just cover the memes and so I'll just cover the memes, a really incredible play by one of the Reddit users, some tips and a really good cosplay. Also, this week features Quopor's Bolt Shot, which I animated to a show for Gwent News. For this week's episode, our guests are Freddy Babes, who is gonna be talking about Challenger. I know it's a bit too late, but this was scheduled right after the Challenger, but it got delayed a lot because of some issues. And also Freddy is gonna talk about Gwent in general. And that's it for the guests. We should have had Ville also with his deck, but unfortunately I took a bit too long and now the deck is outdated. So sorry for that Ville. Still a big still a big shout out to you man. First of all, boys and girls, I want to give you an icebreaker for a conversation with your crush. Here you go. Up for a few rounds of Gwent. This week the gold mine for my contents, um, I mean the Gwen subreddit, has reached 80k followers, so a big congrats from me as well. And now prepare yourself to see the best play of all time. And basically this is Gwen Subreddit in nutshell nowadays. There's only one superior cow in Gwent and it's the prize winning cow and you all should know that. Once again we have an amazing cosplay by Victoria Hofferson here and this, and this time she cosplayed Tris Marigold. Please your eyes. And now for the end of the news segments, I have a few tips that I've gathered over Reddit for the use of the game. Here you go. And now everybody, prepare yourself for the bull shot by Quopor the Longfall. Bullshot. Bullshot. <coughs> Hello everyone and welcome to today's feature show the Bullshot by the one and only Quopor. While teams like Arts and TLG are wasting their time comparing power levels of factions and different decks, Quopor has made the one thing that we all needed. Compare the bold guys of Gwent. Now it's time to compare them. Here I present to you the top 10 list of bold people in Gwent. There should have been more, but Quopor is a lazy ass and he didn't do more than 10. Also, the ratings are based on well thought out arguments, meaning Quopor's opinion. Here we go with the list. At number 10 we have Gaunter Odim, Mirror Master, fulfiller of wishes and owner of the correct head shape. It's a neutral being wandering the world and fulfilling your wishes, but be careful for what you wish. Once he fulfilled your wish, it's almost impossible to do something against it, and almost all of your action will be useless. 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 
useless, useless. And the reason why is he at number 10? It's because he's a dirty casual and lost a death match 10 out of 10 times against All Gear for Everak. Our next stop is position number 9, and who is at position number 9? It's Imlerith. Oh. Oh. Wait, it's an elf. And nobody cares for elves. So we are gonna skip this position. At number 8, we have Letho of Gula. Here's a rare photo of Letho in nature. His favorite environment is being in your hand while Sert and Ox are taking a vacation in your deck. Our next stop is John Natalis, a bald head from Samaria. Legend has it that when Foltes was looking through his rank, he saw a really shiny bald head. And it was the head of Jonas Salis, and since then, Foltas decided to make him the commander of the Tamarian army. And what is the reasoning behind Jonas Salis being in 7th place? Well, it's really simple. You cannot be any higher when there's only one true bald head in the Northern Realms. Yes, I'm speaking about Red of it Africa, who is yet to be revealed. Due to the lack of time and money, we have to skip the next two positions and move on to the fourth position. At number 3, we have Sigismund Dijkstra sitting, but nobody cares for him as he is only the fourth most played leader. Let's move on. Number 2, at number 2 we have Palmerin the Lonefold. The only thing that you need to know is right this one. When Rishik was asked why is Palmerin the very best card in the game, he has provided a straight to the point answer. Yes. Number 1. When CDPR has announced a new faction, there was only one question everybody was wondering about. How many bold heads are we gonna see? There may not have been that many bold cards as we would have wanted, but there's one that has certainly caught our eyes. And it's Madame de Luisa. Achieving this level of head shape correctness and level of thickness is truly unbelievable. But let's move on from this thick lady to the one and only Red of it Africa. This man does 20 fucking points of head shape correctness with fucking Shani. And what do you need more? This concludes our ball shot and see you next time. This is it for the show. Comment down your favorites and now let's move on to the Freddy Babes interview. Hello everybody, I've been asked to give a few, a few thoughts on the Challenger that just happened. Uh, of course with the whole community being there and everything, that was pretty cool. I got to meet a fair amount of uh, people who I've seen on streams and uh, you know on Twitch, on Twitter, etc. Um, which was quite nice. Um, but yeah, generally a cool atmosphere with, with a lot of the community there. Uh, and of course I was playing in it, so I'll give you a few thoughts on, uh, you know, how I prepared for the tournament, uh, how it went, uh, the individual games and stuff, so let's jump into that, shall we? Uh, so how did I prepare for this? Well, uh, I had help from Beardy Bog and Game King, were the main two people, um, but I played a lot of games against myself, in fact, almost all of the games I played were actually uh, against myself, I didn't really um, prep that many games with anyone. Uh, most of the preparation I did with the two of those guys, was thinking about the lineup, thinking about decks, counters, and what the opponents might bring, and all that stuff. So um, that preparation was very, very valuable, of course. Uh, but the majority of the actual gameplay was just me playing against my you know, other account, um, which I find to be quite useful in terms of preparation. Although I would say, yeah, for next time it would be quite nice to uh, to have uh, you know more people who are willing to play against me because I didn't really have enough. Um, uh, you know, of, of those normal games played, I suppose you could say. Uh, as for the lineup, I was playing kind of an Angolem lineup, which you might have seen. Uh, the idea was that everyone will be playing Portal because Bronze, you know, 4P cards got buffed a lot in recent patches, making Portal really good. So if everyone's playing Portal, then that makes Angolem very good because she's five provisions better than a Portal, which is just crazy. Um, and I figured since, you know, uh, Hyperthin was running Portal every time, uh, Arrakis Queen was also running artifacts, and uh, Skelliger had even Totem for Angolem. I figured if I could kind of beat all three of those factions, then I'd be pretty favoured to win the tournament, because it would be hard to avoid playing one of those factions. Uh, in reality, not really anyone brought Hyperthin. I mean, there were a couple of people who played it, um, and there weren't really any SK players apart from Azakov, uh, and likewise with Queen, it wasn't very popular. So uh, kind of missed the mark a little bit on what I thought people would bring. 
in 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 that uh, you know in that sense. Um, but apart from that, I think the idea was very cool and uh, it did work very well. Just the sheer amount of uh, value that Angulem as a card bring uh, brought to the tournament and as a tech card, I think it, it was very, very good. I think where I went wrong was just teching a bit too hard for those uh, three kind of matchups um, with all the tool removal that I was running with Spores and Geralt and stuff like that. Ended up being very easy to play around and just didn't get any value and kind of lost me games. So um, that was probably the biggest mistake there. Uh, kind of didn't have enough time and or didn't see the meta kind of develop. Um, you know, fast enough to see that, okay, the tool removal won't be very useful here. Um, so that was a bit of a regret, but whatever. Um, as for the games themselves, I, but yeah, I played against Magpie. Um, he was actually very, very good out of the gate first tournament, and he did a very, you know, he had a very good showing, I think. Uh, he brought, you know, pretty, um, interesting decks. The Shoot Kalanth especially was a little bit surprising for me. Um, and yeah, generally I think I probably would have beaten him if I had the blue coin, obviously because blue coin um, was working a lot better with what my lineup wanted to do. I needed to beat his Calvite deck because it was hyper thin and that was the kind of only deck I was good against with my lineup, um, really. Uh, so I had to, to beat that with everything. My Arrakis Queen deck couldn't get through against him uh, and that was because I had to play it on red coin against Calvite. So uh, what that means is basically the portal that the Arrakis Queen player plays is weak because the engines that come from it can die, you know, Kiki Moore, Vran, etc. Um, you can't protect them with tactical advantage if you're on red. Uh, and even more so, the, the worst thing is they get to portal first in the round one, um, meaning they get a Fire Scorpion or two developed, um, and they can protect it from Manticore Venom with um, tactical advantage. So that means you basically can't win round one, and that's not necessarily a problem against Hyperthin Ardle. Um, you can still win the game against him, but against Calvi it becomes very, very difficult because they have Invocation for Glusty, um, which just wrecks you if they have last say. Um, so, yeah, the, the matchup there was just very bad from the get-go, the fact that I didn't have another blue coin uh, to play that one. And, uh, yeah, generally my play in the, to in that, in, in the tournament, in the series, uh, was not incredible, but I, I was kind of messing around a little bit in the games because I knew a lot of them were kind of impossible to lose or impossible to win, so... You know, you're thinking things like Arrakis Queen versus Northern Realms is almost just uh, very difficult to win, even if you play it perfectly, if not impossible to win. Uh, and I was very uncertain about what they were playing. Um, and, you know, stuff like Calvite Mirror was basically unlosable for me, so I, I got away with playing a bunch of, you know, technically incorrect plays, because whatever, you lose five points. You're still winning by 20 in that matchup. It's that favoured uh, for, for my deck. So, um, apart from that, People have said you should have eaten the Glusty Warp with Babagazi in the final game to play around Invocation. I probably should have done that. Um, it would have gained me a couple of points extra, I think. It wouldn't have been enough to win the game, though, unfortunately. Um, and in my mind, I figured, yeah, I mean, if I eat the Glusty Warp, the Invocation gets bigger naturally, right? Because there'll be a taller unit on the board. So um, I didn't calculate it all out. You obviously then have to also calculate whether they're pulling Tibor, what their Tibor would pull if they didn't play Glusty Warp from their leader. Uh, there's a bunch of calculations you'd have to do at that point in terms of also whether you eat uh, units to spawn more ones so that Glusty gains more value, but then you play into Invocation more. And I, I didn't really like have time or brain power at that point. I was very fucking tired, um, you know, from, from the previous games to think about all of that. So probably a technically a misplay would have gained me a few more points if I ate Glusty, but it was, unfortunately wouldn't have been enough either way. Uh, to win that game, so um, yeah, really came down to the coin flip and probably my lineup running too much tool removal and being very easy to play around those cards once you have knowledge of them, which um, Magpie did get knowledge of because I played them earlier in the series, so uh, I think that was where I went wrong and uh, lesson learned for next tournament pretty much. Um, and uh, yeah, who did I think would win? I thought Adzikov had a very strong chance, um, and yeah, after seeing his lineup as well, I thought he had a good a good shot at winning. I think he probably didn't play, you know, uh, quite well enough to get the win this time round. Um, and Magpie definitely, you know, had a good showing and was another person that I was uh, very, very scared of in first round, in fact. Probably most scared of getting Magpie because of the uncertain factor, uh, you know, not being able to do any kind of research on what he had played in the past and whatnot is a big deal. So, um, yeah, good, good job to him and uh, unlucky to Azakov, who I had probably put as a favourite. Um, before, but 
some other general thoughts about Gwent, because why not? Um, I haven't been playing many other games uh, either. I haven't played any Gwent since getting back from Challenger. I'm a little bit overloaded from all the tournament preparation, as you can imagine, uh, and playing a game as a job effectively, which is what it turns into for this tournament prep. It becomes very uh, intense and a lot of hours put in. Uh, it really kind of makes me want to take a bit of a break for a little uh, a little bit. So I'll probably wait until, you know, the expansion comes out or something to play more Gwent. But um, definitely the game's in a good spot right now and it probably will only get better with uh, more cards and more interesting stuff added. I had a huge amount of fun actually preparing for the tournament. It was just really cool finding a bunch of new combos and, uh, you know, uh, countering stuff. And I've even got some other secrets that I will be keeping for the, for the future tournaments that I discovered. But um, definitely a huge amount of fun. Uh, and it really did feel like old Gwent and old tournament preparation in terms of finding those little hidden gems in in, in the cards and the texts and the secrets that people aren't playing on ladder. Um, so that was really nice, uh, I would say. And yeah, apart from that, it was just a good, you know, nice challenger. I'm a little bit sad that the event uh, has been, you know, downscaled. The challenger uh, basically became an open um, with the community members there. You know, the community, it was nice having them there, but... Uh, I... It was a bit sad to not have a proper challenger with, you know, the full uh, uh, epic uh, location and uh, extra kind of work put into the videos and, uh, you know, s special stuff in between uh, the, the player segments and whatnot. So uh, that was a shame. Uh, it just seems like there's a general uh, trend of cutting back a little bit on, uh, on the esports for Gwent, which you know, sucks, but what can you do? Um, that's just how the game, you know, where the game is at at the moment. Uh, in terms of Season 2, I would love to play in it, if there would be any announcement of it. Uh, there hasn't yet, so I'm not super hopeful that it will be very good uh, to be playing Season 2 of Gwent Masters as a profession. I'm not sure there's going to be that much money in it. Um, if, if uh, you know, trends are, uh, you know, pointing in that direction, which it seems like they are. Um, but we'll see. I'll definitely, of course, play the Masters and then uh, see where to go from there if... If the Gwent stuff, and I hope it is, if, if the tournaments are good and, and worthwhile uh, playing, then I definitely will be trying to get into them. Because I do really enjoy the Gwent tournament scene. I think it's still very, uh, it's a very fun thing to be taking part in. And it's very, uh, um, you know, very good good to do. So, um, yeah, hopefully we get news on that. Um, I've been asked, what is some advice for being a pro or a caster? Well, I would say, don't become a pro player just yet. Maybe wait <laughs> a little bit until... Uh, until something is announced for the next season of the game. Um, but, you know, uh, if you want to do content creation, if you want to do other stuff, then just go for it. You know, if you have passion for the game, if you enjoy doing it, then it can always be a little thing you do on the side. You can put more time into it if you have it. And that's how I started. Oh, that's an alarm. Uh, that's how I started. That's how a lot of people start. I think you just got to have a passion and an enjoyment for it and just go for it. Uh, and, you know, Maybe something will stick, maybe something won't, but either way you'll have fun doing it, and I think that's the important thing. Um, but yeah, that's just some thoughts from me on the Challenger, Gwen in general and whatnot. Thank you, Dr. Dinners, for having me, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye. Thank you very much, Freddy, for your input. And now... Now should have been the villas part, but... As mentioned before, I... Kinda... Took too long because I was sick, so... Still, it's a big thank you to Villa for making a deck guide. You can find him over on Twitch. I don't know. I'm gonna link it down there, but his name on Twitch is Villa. Villa KS. So you can find him there. And also, he's a really, really great deck builder and a really great player. This weekend, he's this weekend he's playing uh, tournaments. So keep your fingers crossed for him. And also, I'm going to be featuring one of his decks in my next snapshots, or I could say deck guides for you guys. That's going to be coming out on Monday, maybe Sunday, maybe Tuesday. So, keep your eyes peeled for that. This concludes the show. One more time, big thanks to Freddy Vapes and also big thanks to Villa for participating in Gwent News. And see you next time. Uh -huh.